Hey, hey, everybody, it's Kick Scammer time, the show where I DJ Sloper, along with the help from my Kick Scammer detective agency on Discord, find the absolute worst Kickstarters, the scammiest Indiegogos, and most disgraceful GoFundMes to ever find their way onto the crowdfunding platform. And today, I plan to go back and look at the worst of the worst in my fourth compilation of Kick Scammer segments. Now, that's what I call Kick Scammers volume 4 to be precise and in this one I plan to look at 5 evil campaigns campaigns truly created by scumbags, sometimes intentionally sometimes unintentionally regardless they all set out to do the same thing and that was to take money from you for their twisted gain so no messing around here it's time to look at kickstarters most evil campaigns welcome to slopes game room The tragic events of September 11 changed the world, and I'll never forget finishing my job at a local ice cream factory hitchhiking a lift home, getting picked up by a random passerby who instantly said, a plane just smashed into the World Trade Center. I ran home, turned on the news, and saw that second plane hit live. Oh my god. Oh my god. That looks like a second plane. I did not see a plane go in. That that just exploded. I just saw another plane coming in from the To this day a memory that haunts me and something that I will never forget. Shortly after this tragic event, conspiracy quickly spread around it, and in case you have lived under a rock for the last decade or so, the main theory is that the Twin Towers didn't fall down just because planes hit them, but instead it was a planned explosion put forward by someone else. Crazy amounts of videos discussing this ended up surfacing online including specially made movies, most of which are quite traumatizing to watch, especially for the families of the victims. And although I'm not here to side with any particular party, what I will say is that no matter what you believe, none of us know for sure, because none of us truly knows what happens when a plane of that size hits a building of that size, because this sort of thing, and I'm sure the comment section will correct me here, has never happened before to this magnitude. And because of this, it is my unfortunate pleasure to introduce September 11th Redux, the Indiegogo campaign by Paul Salo. What? Well, it doesn't look like much, does it? Damn right it doesn't look like much, because Indiegogo had the sense to step in and take it down. Why? Because this guy wants to recreate 9-11. So, looking on that Wayback Machine and a few videos on YouTube, we can get a nice glitchy look at what this crazy campaign was all about. Basically, for $1,500,000, you can help this happen. The goal of the 9-11 Redux project is to impact a Boeing 767 on a structure similar to the World Trade Center in order either to debunk or confirm the various 9-11 conspiracy theories. We will drone convert a Boeing 767 so that it can be flown remotely. This technology has been available commercially for several years now and is technically feasible. The drone 767 will be piloted manually at takeoff, followed by a manually piloted chase plane. The chase plane crew will include a pilot who will remotely fly the 767 drone. Once the chase plane is in position, the pilots will remotely take control of the drone and then conduct some basic flight control tests. Once complete, the 767 drone pilots will parachute out of the aircraft. The remote pilot will then descend the drone and accelerate to the target impact point on the selected building. The drone will be fitted with a GPS guidance system to help guide the plane to the impact point. Several aviation engineers have confirmed that it will be difficult, if not impossible, for a Boeing 767 to hit its target accurately at the maximum impact speed of the official story at sea level. We only get one shot at this, so we need to make sure we get it right. It's impossible to replicate identically the World Trade Center towers without building them from scratch, so we will find a steel-framed building that matches as close as practically possible to the towers. 
our aim is to match the impact parameters with the official story. For example, if we replicate Flight 175, then we'll aim to impact the building 29 floors below the roofline at a pitch angle of 6 degrees downward, a bank angle of 38 degrees left wing down, and an impact speed of 540 miles per hour. Then we wait and observe. Are any horizontal ejections visible during the collapse? Does any molten material appear? You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Do the black boxes survive? Do the passports survive? And many other observations. There are many family members of victims, first responders, and general public who have unanswered questions about 9-11. If the government won't answer them, then we will. Join us. So many alarm bells are going off here. Firstly, the building will obviously not be the same size as the World Trade Center. It's not going to have the same weight due to the crazy amount of people that were inside the plane. What about the absolute exact entry of the plane? There's just so many things that they can't get exactly right, which in turn will obviously end up with even more conspiracy theorists saying the obvious. Well, it's not exactly the same as what happened on September 11th, so you can't add that. And you know what? They're right. All this campaign would have done is upset the thousands if not millions of people affected by this tragic event. Believe what you want, but this wouldn't have changed anything. So, obviously with the campaign ending early, there's no concrete way of finding out if it was going to get funded or not, or how much was raised. But possibly more interestingly is the available perks on offer. You got the usual thanks for helping $1 goal, $25 to be found in the name of the credits when they document it, and $125 for a t-shirt. But then, it gets really mental. For only $1,000 you can get a chunk of rubble from the crash site, which they claim would be a great conversation starter. And for $5,000 you can get a front row seat to watch the collision happen from multiple angles surrounded by like-minded people. So yeah, there you go, September 11th Redux in a nutshell. A touchy subject, obviously for good reason. And honestly, I'm not here to point fingers, and I'm not stupid. I would like to think that all of my viewers and everyone involved in this campaign feel the same mourning towards this tragic event. And I do understand what Paul was trying to do, but if you want my opinion, recreating what is possibly the most horrific day in recent history, well, it's most definitely not the way to go about solving this. Hey there guys, just a quick message to let you all know that I'm thankful you are here. I absolutely love making these videos and the very next video, Kickstarter's Star Wars Scams, oh, it's a pretty, pretty decent one this one, uh, is now available to all Patreons and YouTube members. So if you are a Patreon or YouTube member, you can get over to the secret passworded website where you'll be able to check out that video plus plenty of other videos in their uncensored versions, in their unedited, the director's cut versions the early versions of all my videos th there's loads up there go searching go have fun it's all available to you guys and for everybody else that want to wait a couple of weeks for that video to drop like i said at the beginning of this video please make sure you are subscribed and more importantly that you have hit the notification bell my analytics show me that not everybody that subscribed gets updates on when i release videos like this so it is super super important that you guys also hit that bell otherwise you might miss it anyway let's carry on with the video. So let's chat about adoption. You know, depending on where you are in the world, the adoption process is, you know, going to be a little bit different, but we can all agree uh, for a parent, it's an incredibly hard task to undertake. Over the many years of children needing parents, the process has become extremely long-winded and a bit tedious. But in my eyes, adopting isn't something that should be taken lightly. And although it may have taken years to go ahead, from what I've discovered, it's not because the wannabe parents are trying to find the right child, but instead a child, or at least the adoption agency, trying to find the right parent. This is the most important part of the process, right? You know, for obvious reasons. Well, 
Adopty didn't see it this way. The process can take up to two years as the campaign boasts and the process of adopting a child is very much outdated. If only there was an easier way to speed it all up. <laughs> This is so bad. Apparently, the solution to all of our adoption problems has been in our hand all along with Tinder. For those of you that don't know, Tinder is an app that connects to your Facebook profile, shows up an image of you, and if somebody else likes what they see, they swipe right on your picture, and if they don't like what they see, they swipe left. If two people swipe right on each other, chemistry is instantly there, of course, and it's time to message each other to see if you can hook up and, I don't know what, go bowling or laser tag or whatever it is people do when they go on dates. Now apply all of that ideology to an app called Adoptly and boom, you got yourself a horribly immoral campaign for wannabe parents that can swipe right on the kids that they want and left on the ones that they don't. Just set up a profile and you are ready to go. Adoptly will instantly match you with all eligible options. It's intuitive, easy to use and even a little fun. Just swipe right if you're interested or left to keep looking. That is so upsetting and evil. <laughs> this eventually leads you to being able to IM the child to be double sure that this kid is for you. And hey, that is step two. If they seem too needy or they're into something that, you know, maybe you're not, you know what to do. Swipe next. Guys, this whole campaign is just simply evil in my opinion. It just baffles me that someone or some people in this instance actually believe that this was a good thing and my god what are you basing this on simply the child's looks you know this one looks pretty but Oh boy, this one isn't nice. Okay, this is Blake's bucket list, a GoFundMe created back in 2016, and this pixelated face that you see here is Blake. And according to Blake's 31-year-old single mother of four, he is dying. About a year ago, my son Blake fell ill after numerous doctors and me not backing down. He got diagnosed with type 3 von Willebrand. We thought, okay, we can know he's going to be okay. Wrong, the bleeding got worse. He started losing weight and passing out on me. My motherly instinct knew something was wrong. Back to the doctors we go. After 12 tubes of blood and two separate bone marrow tests, we found out it's leukemia. This was what was plastered all over the GoFundMe page and eventually all over random social media pages around the web. Blake made a list of things he wanted to do before he got sick. Now it's my job to help him do just that. It's a heartstring pulling story that I'm sure would have blown up considerably. Sadly though, Blake died. Except he didn't. Just like Jared, he alive. The only reason I've decided to yet do another story like this is because unlike the Aguilar case where nobody knew who did it, in this case Blake's very own mother, one Victoria Morrison, was the person who faked her own son's death in order to get a decent sized cash payout. So what the hell went wrong here? Firstly, Blake was indeed ill, but it wasn't as bad as she made out. He apparently had a typical childlike illness that she did get treated at the doctor's. But she still decided to tell his school about the fake leukemia and even convinced him to sit in a wheelchair while she paraded him around in a shop with a hero event and even got a charity helicopter ride around Tahoe. And it gets even crazier. Not only did she fake his death on Facebook claiming that he was cremated, but she even held a service for him. In 2016, after multiple health complications, 10-year-old Blake's show was diagnosed with type 3 von Willebrand disease and leukemia. Sadly, Blake was received into heaven on the 4th of the 8th, 2017. Please take this moment to reflect on how important it is to honour Blake's life by helping the person that loved him the most. 
<laughs> oh, come on. As well as receiving random donations, the GoFundMe page was also set up with this tragic update. And a donator of one of the mother's dodgy campaigns decided to contact another family member to ask how they was dealing with the loss when suddenly everything came to light. Apparently one of the ultimate scam artists only actually managed to get away with about $2,000 and several gift cards from friends and teachers of Blake for this devilish act. When it was all eventually discovered and the total possible um, earnings are unknown. All four children are now in custody and Victoria Morrison is now in prison for 5 to 12 years. So, to end this video, let's talk about copyright infringement. You can see why people do it, having a nice big name like Naratu or the Monopoly guy would really help, right? But obviously, you need permission, which these guys didn't get. And if that is all you're after, well, I can tell you right now that the Game of Thrones card game Kickstarters also didn't get the correct permission and also got taken down. This was the first campaign, it obviously got suspended, all the usual stuff here, the creator claimed he had copyright but he didn't, and although we can't see it now, commenters on reddit posts showed that the comment section on this campaign was full of people essentially ripping into him which obviously wound him up, and he got very, very aggressive. After this, a second campaign was made over on Indiegogo for what looks to be the exact same thing. This too got suspended. Here we have campaign 3, this time he went back to Kickstarter and claimed he didn't need to get licensing rights as this only had a likeness to Game of Thrones, obviously it too got suspended. Campaign number 4 got suspended the same day it was launched, and campaign number 5 which was actually going to be a board game based on Pac-Man this time, unsurprisingly also got suspended even though he personally names people at Namco, Atari, Ubisoft, that game company and PUBG who are all helping him work on this project. Seriously, I don't know if this guy believes what he's typing or he's just trying to get away with scam after scam. Regardless, he did it and for the fifth and final time, like I said, he got suspended. Now, guys, I've actually gone back and rewritten this script from here on out as honestly, this is the Kickstarter segment that made me feel the most uneasy compared to anything I've ever covered in the past. Yep. You know when you see a link for something that's a bit grotesque, you know it's going to make you feel uneasy and you really shouldn't click it, but you do? Well, that happened to me with this video. Now, in all honesty, when I pressed play, I actually thought it was a video update on this guy, but nope. Sadly, what it was was a video of a live stream that Daniel Perez had left on whilst he dealt with his children. Now it's my understanding that what you see here was streamed somewhere between campaigns 1 to 3. Earlier on in the stream you hear him getting his two young kids of the age of 2 and 3 years old some food, donuts, and at this point something had happened that resulted in one or both of the children spilling their food. And although I refuse to play this video as the audio is absolutely horrific, one of the worst things I've ever had the displeasure of listening to, I will explain it as best I can. Basically, you hear Daniel Perez screaming full pelt at the children, forcing them to eat what they had spilt. Swearing over and over and over again, the children screaming in terror and I assume pain, as you start to hear a couple of minutes of banging and slapping, which is although not confirmed, very likely Daniel hitting those children. The screams from everyone involved get louder and louder until he shouts that he will actually throw them out of the window if they don't shut the f*** up which finally does mute both of the kids. As stated, the video is nothing but this scream, but the audio is absolutely horrendous. And out of everything I've ever covered in the Kick Scammer series, nothing has stopped me in my tracks and made me feel more sick than listening to this. 
Following on from this, several hours later, another video was uploaded by the same account that yet again was audio of Daniel Perez yelling, but this time at his wife during a live stream of Apex Legends. This time about not putting up the correct items to the correct eBay accounts, exposing them both as shady characters doing something, I don't know, possibly illegal, although nobody's exactly sure what they were doing. Regardless, the audio in this video was yet another screaming match between the two individuals. What do you do? You sit there and bulls. You sit there and bulls all freaking day. That's all you can do is bulls all freaking day. Even be kind. Uh, even be kind. How can I be kind when you're texting me that sh News spread about the actions found in these videos like wildfire and an article on Medium by Sid Porter, where a lot of this information actually comes from, goes into detail explaining in real time how many concerned individuals were spreading the videos as much as possible to get the attention of the authorities, which led to a news article popping up the very next day saying that the two children had gone missing. The parents had seen the backlash and were expecting a visit from the Department of Children and Families. So they grabbed what they could and made a run for it. A statewide search almost instantly was underway. Thankfully, it only took a few hours for the family to be discovered as their mobile phones were traced by the local police department. And in the news article from the hour that broke the news, one officer explains that he actually visited them at their house and reported poor living conditions. Shortly after, another video was discovered on a separate channel, again of Daniel Perez, supposedly beating his screaming children again. And yet another video is discovered, but this time Daniel Perez is actually buying drugs on the phone. And yes, as you would expect from this role model, he's doing it whilst his kids are supposedly in the same room. Thanks to the spread of these videos and the people creating the articles detailing what he'd actually done, only a few days later the couple were arrested and their children had been taken away from them. Further articles go into more detail regarding this whole fiasco explaining how the house where the family lived in had no running water for the previous six months and in a last ditched effort by Daniel and his wife Alessandra, they claimed that all of this was done by trolls and hackers to make them look bad as they was jealous due to the $3,217 that they'd earned from the crowdfunding efforts, which I assume were the now suspended Indiegogo campaign via flexible funding. He does eventually admit that the video is real and was indeed him, but also stated that he would never hit a child and the slapping noises were done by him hitting the wall or the bed. Later reports explain that the house had been marked as condemned and unfit for living in, and the children were still being looked after away from the abusive parents. Over the coming months, court dates got moved around, some jail time was served, and in an interview from Daniel that shows he has absolutely no remorse for what he has done, still claiming that the video was actually now partially doctored by the sit-at-home nerds that were jealous of his success. A LinkedIn profile was discovered that, although differently named, was discovered to be an alias of Daniel Perez. Not much to say here except that a new board game was being developed using the Grand Theft Auto IP. I don't think it will come to the shocker of anybody when I tell you this never got made. Still waiting for that court date, the couple got into trouble with the law once again this time by robbing five houses and being caught red-handed with the goods at their new home. And that's where we are. Here are the charges against them and the court date, as from what I can tell, been pushed back yet again. The duo sit in jail with a collective $155,000 bond due to all of the charges against them. It's a story with many twists and turns, starting its life off with a set of clueless kickstarters and ending the worst way possible. Thankfully, according to the reports, the children are finally away from the abuse they supposedly endured, and with the ever-growing list of felonies and thankfully pretty damning evidence against them, I expect some pretty significant prison time for the couple. Imagine this, you're a young 20-something lass driving into Philadelphia late one night when your car runs out of fuel. Crazily scared, you pull over, get out your car and make a move to the nearest petrol station when all of a sudden Johnny the homeless guy comes to the rescue and suggests that you get back in your car and lock the doors. 
a little while later Johnny returns after spending his final $20 on fuel for you so that you can get home. Yeah, what is this guy after, right? Well, excuse me guys, he isn't actually after anything. Besides, Kate admitted to not have any cash on her at the time. But that didn't stop her turning up almost daily from that point on to meet up with Johnny, giving him back the money she owed him, a new jacket, new socks, gloves, a hat and several more dollars every time that she did. Wishing she could do more, she went to GoFundMe to tell her tale and boom, the whole thing blew up. She needed $10,000 to give him rent for a small apartment, a small truck and expenses for six months so that he could find a job of his own and after it hit $402,706 that changed to buying him a house of his own and his own dream truck. But with this episode being all about the biggest GoFundMe scammers, can you guess who the big scammer here is? So. I think this is a good place to stop. As stated, the uh, campaign did extremely well, gaining over $400,000, and uh, those three people involved became very, very big stars for all the wrong reasons. You've got Kate McClure, the young lass who ran the campaign, her boyfriend, Mark DeMako, who kind of acts as the guy on the side, you know, just here to help out. And then, of course, you've got the homeless guy, Johnny Bobbitt Jr. They showed up on multiple radio shows, Good Morning America, The Ellen DeGeneres Show. But was all of this the initial plan? Not in my opinion. The whole thing just got way out of hand. The initial $10,000 goal was put forward and was completely smashed, leading to it becoming more popular and in turn more profitable until it came to this. $402,706. But, um, hold up a second. Let's roll it back. Obviously, by now you know that this whole thing was indeed a scam, but that's not the interesting part of this video. What is, is how it came to be. You see, the campaign went live on November the 10th, 2017, and by the way, it's important for you guys to remember this date, as they claimed they actually created this campaign on the way home after seeing him, you know, for a couple of weeks. So you're not wearing the glasses because you're Hollywood now? No, man. I've got an arm fixing him right eye. But it's Johnny Bobbitt Jr.'s face and story that's gone viral, with thousands giving to the Good Samaritan after an honorable deed two months ago. I was driving down 95 and ran out of gas, so I pulled over to the side of the road. He walked up and he said, get back in the car, uh, lock the doors, you know, I'll be back. Kate McClure says she could tell the man walking up to her off the highway was homeless. Got her gas to help her get back on her way. Wasn't expecting anything in return. Me and my boyfriend Mark went back the next day. He gave him a hundred dollars. I was ecstatic. But our survey says... The true story is that the duo were actually regular visitors of the Sugar House Casino in Philadelphia, and on the return home one night they met Johnny Bobbitt Jr. around the I-95 interstate exit which was close by, a good month before the campaign went live, and this is where the whole story was put together. It started with the couple genuinely handing over the odd $10, a hot drink, and over the next few days, the couple would text each other. Keep in mind, all of this was only found out after the scam was discovered, and they would bounce ideas off each other on how to help this guy. Honestly, guys, in the beginning, from what I can tell, this was a feel-good story. I don't know why, but that homeless guy by Sugar House keeps popping in my damn head today. Dude, I just thought about him. These text messages apparently went on for a fair bit, with the duo finding ways to provide him with food, new clothes, the possibility of a job, for <laughs> some stupid reason a Nintendo Switch, and even went as far as finding ways to get the guy a house of his own. It was all within these messages, most of which were made on October 16th, 2017, again, a good month before the campaign went live, that it was proven that Kate did in fact give him the $10, as stated before, further proving the fact that these guys had known him for a good amount of time. Anyway, the text messages eventually ended and at some point between October 16th and November 10th, the trio worked together and came up with the paying it forward scam. 
gas part is completely made up, but the guy isn't. I had to make something up to make people feel bad. So, shush about the made up part. Again, it's obvious from the get-go that the intentions were indeed there, but it's the lies that help not only make the campaign popular, but also raise the eyebrows of onlookers not exactly believing the story. These messages would apparently continue between Kate and her unnamed friend, explaining how the whole thing is a good idea, and chatting about how she and Johnny have an agreed understanding. Three days later, on the 13th of November, further proof that the whole gas story was fake came out when both Kate and Mark explained to Kate's mother that it wasn't true, but Johnny Bobbitt was true. It was just a little, little lie. lie. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this was only three days after the campaign went live. The next day, more text messages between Kate and her unnamed friend explains the problems that had arisen between Kate and her mother. My mum just called me and said that people go to jail for scamming others out of money. So there's that. That's what my own mother thinks of me. After reading a newspaper, further texts prove that Kate's unnamed friend was getting worried about the whole thing. This gas store is going to backfire. Nah, it's all good. How would it? They're going to interview him one day and ask him, but you need to tell him first. Make sure that he knows. Yeah, we will tell him. This week we have to. Later that night, Kate and Mark discuss the upcoming possible issues and go to meet Johnny, showing him the newspaper and filming his reaction, which she would later upload onto her channel. Damn. The, uh... Holy <laughs> sh**. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there, man, that are trying to help. A lot. Yeah. yeah. We got over, um, as of today, after that article came out. Listen to this. Today. We got, um, 70 donations. Wow. To just today. And they're not little ones either. Some are for 100, you know, five, you know, some are for five, little really? five, 25, you know, 50. You know, a lot of 50s, a few 100s, a lot of anonymous donations. God. And, uh... <laughs> the campaign reaches its end at $402,706. A two-hour-long conversation was recorded involving all three individuals talking to a literary agent about the trio's desire to turn this whole thing into a book and a movie. <laughs> I know it's not exactly a movie, uh, but will this video suffice? The payout gets shipped from GoFundMe to Kate's account, and after taking GoFundMe's fees, the trio is left with $367,108.81. Johnny Bobbitt opens up his very own bank account with $25,000 deposited and $31,622.87 in total is deposited, leading up till March the very next year. Within that time, Johnny had spent of that total $23,644.85, all via cash withdrawals of this money within the area he was originally found homeless. And whilst he was doing that, Kate, who loved a good old selfie, decided to showcase all over Facebook just how awesome her life had become. You've got trips to Vegas, the Grand Canyon, Disney World, Disneyland. As stated earlier, she was even whisked away to the Ellen DeGeneres show. You got New York with Johnny, LA with what people assumed is her mum. She was doing mighty fine, splashing out new handbags, helicopter rides of her boyfriend, and on. February the 21st, she got herself a 2015 BMW for $24,432. Yep, a receptionist that reportedly earned $37,548 in 2016 and a carpenter whose last filed taxes showed that he earned $15,417 from his self-employed job. Yeah, right. <laughs> were very much living a very cushy lifestyle that, let's be honest, even collectively is a bit on the lavish side. What could possibly go wrong? Well, during those 60,000 text messages that police eventually got hold of and had to look through, they discovered that on March the 9th, things were not so good. I can't believe we have less than 10k left. 
I'm so upset now. The text messages between the two continued as Mark attempted to calm her down, reassuring her that it will be okay when the book deal money comes in. In a year, you'll be laughing about when you blew hundreds of thousands. <laughs> oh, little spoiler alert, that, that book deal never goes ahead. <laughs> A couple of days later, more text messages between Kate and her mate went on. She explained how angry she was that Johnny wasn't in rehab any longer, and as we all now know, had relapsed. You really need to get rid of him and get the public off your back by donating. I'll be keeping the rest of the money. Thank you very much. <laughs> As you would expect, as time went on, the duo's worries and frustrations started to build up. Not only was they scared about the possible issues arising from Johnny, but the finances between the two were in quite a bad place. As these text messages went on, there was discussions about selling the BMW in order to pay the bills. It was also showcased during this time that Mark had not been working for a good amount of time. Since November the previous year, in fact, proving it even more difficult to believe them when they said they spent all of their own money on the top end lifestyle that the duo had been living for the last four months. All you need to do is start working at your real job, not the job you think you have. Once you do that, we'll be fine. The tensions rose and messages proved that Mark had built up a bit of a gambling problem. You logged into poker the exact minute you told me you were doing an invoice. I logged into poker ten times today. This back and forth continued and it ended with Kate confirming that the bank account that the original GoFundMe money had gone into was indeed in the negatives. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you blow $367,108.81 in less than 100 days. the day that the whole thing started to publicly implode. The Enquirer posted an article explaining the life of Johnny now. He was struggling to leave the homeless life behind as he once again was relapsing, living in a camper van next to a broken down truck that was actually purchased from the GoFundMe winnings. <laughs> and yes, I'm calling them winnings now. But he does explain that the guy is in rehab once again and apparently driven to the meetings by the couple sometimes and even though tensions have risen between both Bobby and Kate and Mark, mainly due to them drip feeding him money up to this point, the whole article was spun in a way that makes the decisions of the couple quite believable. I don't want him to do anything stupid, he's a drug addict, that's like me handing him a loaded gun. He has to do what he has to do to get his life together. The eventual plan of Johnny's was to obviously get clear of the drugs first and then taking that camper away from his current life and to move to Montana or Alaska where he can pitch up on some land, go hunting and fishing. But like I said, obviously rehab comes first and sadly, none of this ever happened. On June the 11th, Kate sells the trailer for $10,000 as Johnny has moved out. Between this time and August the 10th, reporters came looking for Johnny, who was yet again found homeless under a bridge, and as you would expect, speculation as to why he was homeless again began to pop up. It was during this time that Johnny messaged Mark using his brother's Facebook account saying, We really should talk about things. There have been a lot of people asking questions, and I don't know what to say. We really should get out of here before things go public. I have been trying to avoid people, and it's becoming more and more difficult. We, meaning him and his brother, will get on a bus any time you could take us and watch us leave. I think it's the best idea because we don't want people asking questions. We are still in the same place. We're always on the lookout for you. Hey, I'll get there this weekend. When I do, you get on a bus. No bullsh**. And for those wondering what the big deal is here, uh, basically what they want to do, as in Mark and Kate, uh, they want to get these guys on a bus and just get them the hell away from these reporters. They're constantly getting reported on and people are trying to find Bobby and his brother, who was also a bit of a druggie too, unfortunately. And yeah, the, the best solution in their eyes was just to get them on a bus and get them gone. 
However, on the 23rd, another Inquirer news article came out confirming to the world that Johnny is once again homeless and that the hole gets a whole lot deeper, as reports indicate that the possibility of misspending money has taken place with Johnny himself, saying that he fears the couple have spent the money on vacations and the new BMW, which obviously as we know up to this point is true, but as far as Johnny's concerned, the rest of the money is or should be sitting in a bank account somewhere. In an attempt to set the record straight, the couple went on the Megan Kelly Today show explaining that they indeed do still have well over $150,000 left, but are refusing to give him the money due to his drug problem, which in all honesty is a lie that again is pretty believable. During that time, <coughs> the money was placed into our account and if he needed anything, he had it. It was there was never a question. Right. At this point, we and have to, the, to to the people who read that Inquirer account and said these two they committed a fraud. I know you've been getting death threats now. You tr yeah. you tried to do a good thing. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. What do you want? It's people my to know? family, and it's so hard to deal with because these people are getting one side of the story and receiving death threats, and you know threats to burn my house down and threats against my family and everything like that is so hard to deal with when we know that we did a good thing and I still believe that we did a good thing and I would do it all over again. I would do it all over again for him. Only one day later, Johnny officially started legal action against the couple to get the rest of the money, or to be more specific, stop them from spending the last of it. Two days after this, a judge finally ordered the couple to pay whatever was left into an escrow bank account and to get a forensic accountant to go through the whole thing, which they fail to do. On the day that the money was supposed to go in, Johnny was interviewed and said that Mark is a self-described gambling addict, calling him hypocritical in the process. A very scary conversation was recorded by Kate as she talks to Mark about the whole thing, giving us further proof that this whole thing was indeed a scam. You fucking did this. You fucking did this. Everything. You started the whole fucking thing. You did everything. I had no part in any of this, and I'm the one fucking taking the fall. Because of you, because of me listening to you. I might be going to jail because of something Stop that it. you Stop said. It. Stop what? You don't go to jail for lying on TV, you dumb bitch. But who made me lie on TV? Who cares? What do you mean, who cares? I care. Who f***ing wrote all this shit on GoFundMe? Please stop. Please stop. Please stop. You're blaming me. You're blaming me. You're blaming me. You're blaming me. You dumb f***ing You're blaming me because a junkie decided to start f***ing bullshit. That's what you're falling for? You weak And Johnny's lawyer confirms that all of the money is gone after a conversation with the couple's lawyers. A warrant is sent out for police to search Kate and Mark's house where the BMW is taken away and among other things that eventually led to all of the evidence found in this video. And then GoFundMe also confirmed that they're going to be paying Johnny themselves any money that he did not receive out of the original $400,000 donated. Mark is seen leaving a courthouse alone where he has been due to an unrelated minor traffic incident and when questioned about the GoFundMe scam he explains that he was very excited to explain what has happened to all of the money and that it will become crystal clear very soon. That date ladies and gentlemen never came because on November 15th both Mark and Kate were arrested and charged with second degree theft by deception and second degree conspiracy to commit theft by deception. 
By this point, the duo had split up, and in an attempt to push the blame away from Kate and onto Mark, that secretly recorded audio footage played earlier on became public, showing that the whole thing was originally constructed by Mark and that Kate only did what she was told to in a very abusive relationship. Her lawyer even went on the air to further discuss this and to give his well-paid opinion to the world. And now that it's unclear if Johnny was involved himself or not in the scam, GoFundMe actually refund every single backer instead of giving him the money and on Christmas Day confirmed that this has happened. Johnny Bobbitt finally pleads guilty to being involved and Johnny is sentenced to a five-year special drug rehabilitation program set by the court and if he does not stick to it, it's prison time. He also got this by agreeing to testify against Mark and Kate. Kate admits to the whole thing and pleads guilty while still pointing the finger at her ex-boyfriend Mark. In fact, she was too given a plea deal in exchange for four years in prison to testify against Mark too. Her confirmed sentence is yet to go ahead. And Mark is then accused of half a dozen criminal charges against him, which he pleaded not guilty to, but with all of the evidence against him, plus his ex-girlfriend and Johnny the homeless guy agreeing to testify against him too, the accusations of wire fraud and money laundering carry a total possible prison time of 30 years and a fine of $500,000. It is very unlikely he is going to be getting away with this. And there you have it. Besides the actual sentencing, which isn't looking too great for Mark or Kate to be fair, the whole thing was one massive snowball of greed. That honestly, if split evenly and everyone went their own way early on, would have been an easy thing to pull off. Seriously, everyone would have got away with what they were doing. But like I said, greed got in the way and because of that this whole thing just got way out of hand leaving three people with a very naughty but still life-changing experience which ended up getting themselves well a kind of a different life-changing experience <laughs> Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video as per usual. I know it's a bit of a compilation one this week, but I have been working on loads of other kickscan ones that have just taken a little bit longer, so I like to put these ones out so I can spend a bit more time on these bigger videos. And I've got the Star Wars Kickstarter scam video coming up, so keep an eye out for that one. Uh, I've got a Metroid video I'm working on as well, and obviously the next Complete History is well underway as always. But yeah, this is the part of the video I'd like to give a massive shout out to all of the Patreons and YouTube members that do allow me to make these videos uh, every single week pretty much. So thank you to all of the following people. 8BitGamer88, Aaron Gorman, Agro Crag, aka um, Akatimo84, Andrew Dalton, Arista, Benjamin Guy, Big Rico, Bram Perez, Cheshire One, Chris the Shapeshifter, Chris Walker, Christopher Devero, Clan Bob, Conrad Constantine, De Action Saxon, Dalton, aka Chevmatic, Daniel Torres, Dina, Dina81, Digsy B, Game Apologist, Gary Pinkett, Ian Quell, Intrigued Gaming, Jay is Manchild, Jabba Al Aiden, James, Jeff Mianowski, Jeremy Rodriguez, um, Jeremy Jeremy Beaver, so I missed you there. Josh Gibbons, King Link Reviews, King of Carrot Flower, Luca Soft Tail, Luca uh, Luca Soft Tail, Luke Jorgensen, Man Shovel, Matt Jackson, Michael Ridley Dash, Mike Fallon, Mind of the Unsane, Nicholas Burtner, Nick Pollard, Over Joel Zane, Roll VP, Ray Blair, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Richard Aldegic, Roven Army, Ryan Holtz, Sir Nilsson, Shade Silence, Shadow Dragon, Sonic's Captor. Stephen, Taylor Rainwater, That Gamer, The Cunning Linguist, The Sneaky Ferret, Tim Lund, Todd Paul Float G, Vetus Varnes, Vikeko, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, and Ye Old Hamburglar. Like I said, all of those people I just mentioned, plus many, many more are the people that allow me to make these videos. They're the people that get to see my videos early over in my Discord, in the secret rooms, and plenty of other things as well. So thank you to all of you awesome, awesome people that allow me to do this sort of stuff. So thank you, thank you, thank you. But anyway, guys, I mean, that's enough for now, isn't it? Yes. This is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.